Welcome to this rapid revision video looking at the work of Fleming, Florey and Chain and their development of penicillin, the first truly effective antibiotic medicine. So how was it discovered? How was it made into an effective medicine? And why was this important? Our story begins with Alexander Fleming. Let's have a look at his training and background. Fleming had been a military doctor in World War I and experienced the frustration and tragedy of men dying from blood poisoning and staphylococcus infections from otherwise minor wounds. He became determined to find a solution and a cure for these sorts of infections and he began working at St Mary's Hospital in London researching antibiotics. He made his discovery in a variety of ways and firstly we must recognise that he had been looking for an antibiotic cure but without much success. An antibiotic is one which fights bacterial infections. So anything that happens by chance following this, we should look at in the context of someone who was actually looking for this answer. In 1928, Fleming went away on holiday. Upon returning, he found a mould culture disc, dish or petri dish with a strange phenomenon. A blotch of white mould had grown on it and it appeared to be preventing other mould from growing. It appeared even to be killing it. We can see this in the picture of the dish at the bottom of the screen here. There's a mould culture that has been wiped onto the dish and we can see the blotch of white penicillin mould at the bottom with a margin where it is either preventing the spread of the other mould or even killing it. Studying this, Fleming was able to identify the penicillium bacterium and that it worked as an antibiotic medicine. If you're taking part in a quiz and you're faced with the question, who discovered penicillin? Chances are people are expecting you to say Alexander Fleming, but we need to be a bit careful here and look at how successful he actually was. Fleming was successful in publishing his ideas and he tried to make a practical medicine out of the penicillium called penicillin. He grew cultures of penicillin in tubs in his laboratory, but it was difficult to produce enough to make a practical cure. For this reason, Fleming's work was not initially taken that seriously. Penicillin was seen as impossible to make and therefore impractical. This meant that the introduction of penicillin medicines was probably delayed by years, but Fleming had made a start. So now we need to have a look at how penicillin went from being a vital discovery to a practical and useful medicine. It seems fair to start at stage one, 1928, and Fleming's discovery of penicillin. So as we've already slightly covered, many soldiers in the First World War developed infected wounds. Chemical antiseptics were used successfully to kill many infections, but they did not heal infections caused by the streptococci and staphylococci bacteria. Soldiers with those infections died. A scientist called Alexander Fleming was sent out to France to study these wounds and then back to England. He worked on finding a way to deal with these bacteria. The hunt took 10 years, but in 1928 he found the answer. While away on holiday, he left a pile of dishes containing bacteria on his laboratory bench. On his return, he sorted out the dishes and noticed mould on one of them. Around the mould, as you can see in picture A, the staphylococci bacteria had disappeared. Fleming then experimented with penicillin mould on living cells. He discovered that if it was diluted, it killed bacteria without harming the other cells. He made a list of the germs that it killed and he used it to treat a colleague's eye infection. However, it did not seem to work on deeper infections and it took a very long time to create enough penicillin to use. In 1929, Fleming wrote about penicillin in a medical journal, but nobody thought his article was important. He had not even used penicillin on animals to heal infections, so he had no real evidence of it being useful. But here we can see Fleming's original petri dish. The mould is at the top, the bacteria originally around it have disappeared and been killed, but the bacteria further away have survived. The mould had probably been grown by another scientist in the room above Fleming's and spores had floated out the window, in through Fleming's window, before landing in the one place that they could have an effect and be noticed. But we've got to give credit to Fleming to actually notice this. There you can see the gap between the growing mould and the penicillin at the top. But what about turning it into an effective medicine? Stage two is 10 years later and looks at 1938, Florian Chain's research and trials. In 1938, Howard Florey and Ernst Chain were researching how germs could be killed and read Fleming's article on penicillin. They realized that it could be very effective and they tried to get funding from the government. They got 25 pounds and that wasn't even a lot of money back then. However, with the Second World War near at hand and no proof that penicillin could cure people, the government had other things to spend its money on. I don't know, tanks and spitfires, I imagine. Instead, Florey asked for money from America. 
and he got enough to pay for five years' research, which was certainly handy. They discovered that penicillin helped mice recover from infections, but to treat one person they needed 3,000 times as much penicillin. Even large drug companies could not afford to fund this quantity of work, so Florian Chain began to grow penicillin themselves in whatever they could, using hundreds of hospital bedpans. By 1941 there was enough penicillin to test on one person. The volunteer was Albert Alexander, a policeman who had developed septicemia, a bacterial infection, from a tiny cut. It seems that he got it on his eye from a rose thorn, of all things. Chemical drugs had not killed the infection, and it was clear that Albert was dying. Florian Chain requested permission to try penicillin, and injections began. The penicillin worked, and Albert began to recover. However, they ran out of penicillin after five days, and even though Florian Chain were extracting unused penicillin from Albert's urine and reusing it, using it in a desperate attempt to keep treating him, without penicillin, Albert died. However, penicillin had shown that it worked, and it wasn't harmful to the patient. Not good news for Albert, but it could save lives in the future. They just needed to find out a way of making enough of it. Stage 3, 1941, and the wartime need for penicillin. The slightly dodgy illustration you see here shows an American medic on D-Day treating a wounded soldier. It's all very well being able to stop the bleeding, but if an infection gets in and it's not treated, that soldier's going to die anyway. If you like the picture though, this is one of the ones I did on my whiteboard once, and I do have an Instagram that's called Dry Wipe History if you want to see more of the same. Anyway, enough of the plug on that, back to the revision. English factories were working flat out during the Second World War to try and produce enough uh, weapons, and so they couldn't be used for mass production of penicillin. So Flory went to America, and at just the right time. At the end of 1941, America was attacked by the Japanese at Pearl Harbor, and they entered the Second World War. The American government realised the potential of penicillin for treating wounded soldiers and made interest-free loans to US companies to buy the expensive equipment needed for making it. Soon, British firms were also mass-producing penicillin, and there was enough to treat the all of the Allied wounded on D-Day in 1944, over 2.3 million doses. So it could be made into a practical medicine with sufficient investment into the ind industry. This source shows penicillin being used in practice during the Second World War. It was written by Lieutenant Colonel Pulvertaft, and he's describing the first use of penicillin by the British Army in 1943. We had enormous numbers of infected wounded, terrible burns cases among the crews of the armoured cars. Sulfonamides had absolutely no effect on these cases. The last thing I tried was penicillin. The first man I tried it on was a young New Zealand officer called Newton. He had been in bed for six months with compound fractures to both legs. His sheets were soaked with pus and the heat of Cairo made the smell intolerable. Normally he would have died in a short time. I gave three injections a day of penicillin and studied the effects under a microscope. The thing seemed like a miracle. In ten days the leg was cured and in a month's time the young fellow was back on his feet. I had enough penicillin for ten cases. Nine out of the ten were complete cures. And given what doctors like Polvertaf were used to, this would have seemed truly miraculous. Stage four of the development, after World War II. After the war ended in 1945, penicillin began to be manufactured and used by everyone, not just the armed forces. This still took time, but antibiotics became more and more common in the 1950s and 1960s, gradually turning from a wonder drug into just an ordinary, everyday lifesaver. The source here shows tanks used to produce penicillin. The quantity needed is difficult to comprehend. 2,000 litres were needed to treat just one case of infection. In June 1943, 425 million units of penicillin were being produced. That was enough only, though, for 170 cases. This time for our final points, we're going to just summarise how penicillin was developed, using a variety of factors, starting with chance, then moving on to war, governments, science and technology, and individual genius. Firstly, chance. Fleming's discovery of penicillin was essentially by chance, although it took his prepared mind to recognise the importance of what he saw. The Second World War provided the need for penicillin to save soldiers' lives. It also encouraged cooperation between the Allied nations to mass-produce it. Governments recognised the importance of penicillin, and with the war as a motivator, they were prepared to provide them money to develop it. Scientific inquiry and discovery allowed penicillin to be tested, proved, and then developed quickly. The massive industrial capacity of the United States allowed the mass production of penicillin to be stepped up equally quickly.
and Fleming was able to find penicillin and recognise its importance, but he was unable to make it into a practical medicine. That's where Florian Chain step in. They cooperated to demonstrate how penicillin could become a practical medicine, persuading the governments to invest in it. So taken all together, these factors are why penicillin became the first really effective antibiotic medicine. That's the end of this rapid revision video. I hope it's been useful to you. And if it has, please like the video and subscribe to the channel for more. But for now, I'll say goodbye and good health.